Okay, so welcome to Kasumu Bible Institute. Um, this is the third uh, week, and we are going to be studying this week the covenants, the covenants of God. Last week we talked about the uh, seven dispensations of Scripture. And we talked about the mechanics of justification and how a person is justified by faith and how that they're justified by obedience uh, throughout the different dispensations of Scripture. But this week we're going to talk about a very deep subject about the covenants. And this relates to the veracity of God. This is one of the attributes of God. It's the truthfulness of God. The truthfulness of God. See, the concept of a covenant is pretty foreign to Westerners. Westerners don't really think about covenants much. Because we relate to people more on the terms of a contract. We understand what a contract means. But a contract is different from a covenant for a lot of different reasons. A contract is based upon mistrust. Two parties that do not trust each other come into an agreement. That's why they have the contract. So that they can keep each other accountable. So it's based upon mistrust. But the covenant is actually based upon trust. Two parties that already trust each other come into an agreement with each other. You don't call a marriage a marriage contract, right? <laughs> it's a marriage covenant because two parties that already trust each other are coming into an agreement with each other. And now we're living in a time and a day when there's no respect for covenant. There's no understanding of covenant especially in the modern church. They don't even understand what the difference between the new and the old covenant is. We hear people all the time say, oh, well, you're not supposed to eat shellfish and you're not supposed to do all these things that are under the old covenant. It's because they have no understanding of covenant. No understanding of covenant. They don't understand the different divisions. They don't understand it. Because it's not being taught. So that's why we're teaching it today. We're teaching you the basis of the covenants. What does the covenants, what do they tell? What picture are they telling? From the beginning of the Word of God to the end, the entire Bible is woven with covenants. Covenants are all throughout the Scripture. God making an agreement with man. And in each situation... In each situation, there is either a conditional or unconditional covenant made. They're always either conditional or unconditional. In Psalms chapter 74, let me read, I mean, make sure that that's the correct one. Well, first of all, I want to read Psalms, uh, Psalm 25. Psalm, this is going to be the, the theme scripture. Psalm 25, 14. What people don't understand about covenants is, it's deep. It's a very deep subject. Very deep. Because like I said, the entire Bible is woven with these covenants. So the Bible says in Psalm chapter 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him and He will show them His covenant. What's interesting is, it didn't say covenants. It said covenant. Because He's talking about a particular covenant. A covenant that is to be future revealed. A covenant that is... We're going to get to later. I don't want to spoil it right now. But it's a covenant that is future. God is going to show them the covenant. He's going to show them the meaning of that covenant. But he said the secret of the Lord is to them that fear Him. 
and he will show him the covenant. So what is the basis of understanding a covenant? The fear of God. Having a fear and a reverence for God. The fear of God. That is one of the basis. Malachi chapter 2, verse 5. Malachi 2, 5. says this. It says, My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave them to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. He's talking about Levi in this. And that's a covenant I'm going to talk about later. That's um, under the Mosaic Covenant, and it's about the priest. Uh, it's about the covenant of the everlasting priesthood, but we're going to get to that in a bit. But the point is, is that it was revealed to them through the fear which they had for God. God revealed the covenant to them because of their fear that they had, their reverence and their awe. You know what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 74? This is, this is good. Psalm chapter 74. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, 74 verse 20. Psalm 74 verse 20. See, there's all kinds of hidden treasures in these psalms here. It says, Have respect unto the covenant. Have respect, respect unto the covenant. For the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. We're living in a day that does not respect the covenant. They have no respect unto the covenant. So and that is why the earth is filled with the habitations of cruelty. They have no understanding of the covenant, and because they don't understand the covenant, they don't respect the covenant. That's why it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, it says they've trampled underfoot the Son of God and counted the blood of the covenant wherewith they were sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite to the Spirit of grace. You know, in the Old Testament, I'm not jumping too far ahead, but you became ritually impure. If you did certain things like touch dead bodies or animals or uh, you became ceremonially unclean through bodily fluids in many, many different types. But this was not sin. It wasn't sin to become ritually unpure. What was, what was sin was to approach, approach God in that state. That was the sin. It wasn't to be ritually impure, but it was to approach the holiness of God in an impure state. That was the sin. That is why Nadab and Abihu, when they approached God burning the strange fire, had no respect under the covenant, and they were burned. If you read in uh, Leviticus chapter 10. So the impure... Was being impure ritually was not the sin, but it was approaching the holiness of God. You could picture the holiness of God like the sun. The sun gives light, heat, you know, and, and life to our planet. But what happens when you become too close to it? You get burned. It becomes dangerous. So when you approach the holiness of God in that impure state, that was sin. Because they had no respect unto the covenant. And that's the problem with our, our modern church. There's no respect for the covenant because they don't understand it. They don't understand. There's no more majesty. There's no more reverence for these things. They don't revere the, the, um, the power of the covenant, the everlasting covenants that God made. So first we're going to start off with the first covenant. We're going to start with the first covenant. There's seven covenants. Imagine that, right? Mm -hmm. The Edenic covenant. The Edenic covenant. The first covenant that God made with man. Now, we're not going to go into the eternal past and talk about did God make a covenant with the angels and did God make a covenant with others before this. We're not going to talk about that because we don't have any info on that. We're talking about the covenants that God made with man in the creation. 
You, the Bible is the story of man's redemption. It's not the story of everything. So when you read the Bible, you don't get the answers to all scientific questions and where did the dinosaurs come from and all that. That's, that's not, it's not for, it, it's not important because the Bible is the story of man's redemption. It's a story about how man is restored into fellowship with God. So it doesn't give us all answers to all these things. So the Edenic covenant was the first covenant God made. And it was a conditional covenant. Conditional covenant. God made a conditional covenant with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That's where you get the word Edenic. In the Garden of Eden. And all they had to do was obey God and not do one thing, which we talked about last week, was to eat of that one tree. It was a condition. The condition of this covenant is you will have life, you will have peace, you will have happiness, you will have blessing, you will have my fellowship, we'll walk together in perfect harmony. The only condition that I have for you is don't eat of that one tree. That's it. And of course, man and his rebellion and failure and failed. He failed that covenant. But, I'm going to get to this later. That covenant was not disannulled because God's going to keep that into the covenant. I'm going to get to that, I'm going to get to that later. I'm going to get to that later. Man failed his end of the covenant. But I'm going to get back to that. The next covenant we're going to talk about, I'm going to go a little quicker on these first two. The Adamic covenant. God's covenant with Adam. Now, this was... I like to call this the covenant of the curse. This was a unconditional covenant. An unconditional covenant that God made with Adam. He said, Adam, you've sinned against me. You've rebelled against me. You've done all this wickedness against me. Now, I'm going to give you a promise. The promise is you're going to earn your living. by the sweat of your face and brow. You're going to work now. You're not going to get a garden that's all taken care of and that's all just all you have to do is sit around and eat fruit all day. Now you're going to now you're going to pick up that plow and you're going to start working. And you know another thing? The ground's not even going to yield its strength anymore. I'm going to curse the ground. And you know what, Eve? Because you listen to that serpent, I'm going to give you another promise. When you, try, when you bear children, it's going to hurt. Be bearing children will be with sorrow and pain. You're going to bear your children with sorrow and pain, Eve. These are the promises that I'm making unto you under the Adamic covenant. I'm making promises unto you. And these are unconditional. It means you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. I just promise you that you're going to have to work now and that when you bring forth children, it's going to be in sorrow and pain because of your rebellion and your sin, because you broke that covenant. It was an unconditional promise that God made upon Adam and Eve. It, it wasn't based on conditions. They didn't have to do anything to get those rewards. They've already earned that because they broke that first covenant. So God made them another promise. And that promise was that now the earth is not going to be like it was before because now sin has entered into the world. And death by sin. And it outlines that in Romans 5. But I'm going to go... Th a lot of people don't add these into the, to the main covenants, but they're very important because it gives the basis of the other covenants. It's kind of a foundation. The next major covenant is the Noetic covenant. God's covenant with Noah. And this was another unconditional covenant. 
Another unconditional covenant that God made with Noah. But he didn't just make it with Noah, but he made it with the whole world. And I want to go back to this. God put a token on these covenants. God puts a token on these unconditional covenants. It's interesting. Um, I even put a token on, on the conditional covenant. Well, the, token, the tokens that he gives, first of all, we're talking about the Noetic covenant, the rainbow. Remember last week, the token? God would give a token on these covenants. This was the token that God gave them. That token was the rainbow. And we're going to get to the other tokens later. But these are the signs and the promises of their fulfillment. But this was an unconditional covenant to the whole world, the whole earth. It said, I establish my covenant with me, with you. Genesis chapter 9. God institutes capital punishment, like I said last week. Why is that? Because the earth had already corrupted itself and become violent and wicked and God had to judge it. So now God in, in the human government dispensation, we're not outlining them by human government, now we're outlining them by covenant. God gives them that capital punishment so that they can keep the peace and the order so that it doesn't become out of control like it did before. But God makes a, a, a covenant with the whole world that he would never flood the earth again with water. Never again. Never again would he flood the earth with water. God gave man the earth. God gave man the water as a flood. God gave man the wind of the Holy Spirit. He gives him the fire of judgment. Earth, water, wind, and fire. You so can what's see. The first tokens? Okay, the token here was life. Oh, the token here was the fact that the day you eat of it, you should surely die. So death was the token of that covenant. The day you eat of that, you shall surely die. He told them, the day you eat, you shall surely die. Over here, the token of that covenant was the fact that they were going to live forever in peace. They had an eternal. They were never going to die. They didn't have to die because sin had not entered into the world. Mm -hmm. And so here, the day they eat of it, they're going to die. His death had now entered into the world. So these are, and you're going to see why are these right next to each other? Because it's a contrast. Something happened here that we'll never even fully understand until we get into eternity. We don't even realize what happened there. We, don't, we, we can't even come to grips with it. It's so deep. It's so deep that this, these first three chapters of Genesis, more happened there than happened anywhere in the Bible, even outside probably even the cross. Man's fall from God was so unbelievable because being out of fellowship with God would have been just... It's hard even for us to even understand it. It's a mystery. You know, how could we have been such, had such a strong relationship with God one minute and the next minute we're doomed for eternal fire? I mean, it's just, uh, the fall there was so hard. Mm -hmm. And so these covenants, uh, the contrast between these two covenants is so strong. Now death was the token. You're going to die now. And as I said before, the day you eat, you shall surely die. And he didn't even live to a thousand years. We talked about that last week. So that was the unconditional covenant. Now we have noetic covenant. We have the token, the rainbow. God gave the token. The next to token we're going to talk about is Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant. Abrahamic covenant. Now this covenant's deep. <laughs> We're talking about a deep covenant. This is a deep covenant. So how do you even describe this covenant? This is the beginning of the Israeli covenant. The beginning of Israel covenant. Israeli covenant. 
because it was also extended to Jacob, the grandson of Abraham. Okay, so God promised Abraham a land, a nation, and a seed. Three things. Three everlasting promises were made to Abraham. Abraham, you're going to walk through the length and the breadth of this land. That's what he says in Genesis chapter 13. I'm going to read it. He says, Lift up now thine eyes, look from the place where thou art, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. And I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth. So if a man could number the dust of the earth, so shall thy seed be. Now, has Israel ever numbered the dust of the earth? No. Israel has never numbered the dust of the earth. So has that covenant fully been fulfilled? No. And we're going to get to that later. So the land covenant. God gave them the land from the river of Egypt E G Y P T the river of Egypt to the Euphrates That is a huge piece of land by the way Now the river of Egypt is talking about the uh, the Nile Delta all the way to the Euphrates River, which is a huge area of land. And if you know anything about what Israel geographically looks like today, it's a little sliver of land in Palestine that's about a tenth of that size right now. It doesn't incorporate any of the land of Jordan, any of the land of Iraq or Syria or the Sinai Peninsula or any of that. That whole area is small compared to what God has promised them. So that promise has not yet been fulfilled. Has not yet been fulfilled. That's an unfulfilled promise. But it doesn't mean that God lies because God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he must repent. It says there are numbers. <laughs> I'll always love that verse. Numbers chapter 23. God promises that he will not lie. God is, will not lie to Abraham. Someday Israel will have this entire land. This entire land for an everlasting possession. You know what's interesting? If you look at the dimensions of the new Jerusalem, it's almost about this size or even bigger. The dimensions of the new Jerusalem, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. It's actually high. 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, or 1,500 miles long. It says 12,000 furlongs, and a furlong is one-eighth of a mile, which is about 1,500 miles. And if you did a map of that in the United States, someone did like drew one on the United States, and it was like from Texas to North Carolina to Illinois. It was a huge piece of land. And this is all going to be the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. But that's part of the covenant. And then he promised them a seed. And if you, if we read that last week in uh, Galatians chapter 3 and uh, 19. He said, He said, Not and unto seeds as of many, but unto thy seed unto thy seed which was Christ. That's what it says in Galatians. So the seed He promised them was Christ. The seed. He was going to be a father of many nations. He was going to be given a land that was ten times the size of the land that they have now. And he was also going to be given a seed. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about when that what the future uh, in a future covenant, this gets more detailed. 
in the Davidic covenant. We can get to that in a second. Yes, this is an unconditional covenant. It's unconditional because Abraham didn't have to do anything to receive it. God promised it to him as an everlasting possession. See, God always fulfills his end of the covenant. Always. Even if man rejects God will still fulfill it. And, and, and it doesn't, and it's interesting is it may not be fulfilled at that time. But when you get to the new covenant, you'll see how it's all fulfilled. This is good. Because it's all gonna get you will see everything's gonna open up when we get to the new covenant. Hope I left enough space. But the seed. It says in Galatians, it talks deeply about that in Galatians 9. Um, I think it was three. I thought we talked about that last week. About the seed. Okay. The Abraham covenant, it goes even deeper and deeper. But as I said, the more I started studying these covenants, the deeper it got. And I was just like, how deep do you go with it? But you can get into all the different depths of, you know, Isaac. God gave, made a covenant with Isaac. And then he made a covenant with Jacob, which was Israel. So really, this is the Israeli covenant as well as it is the Abrahamic covenant. Because God made a covenant with Jacob as well, that his 12 sons would be the 12 tribes of Israel. And so, um, you, just could get, you just could keep getting deeper and deeper into it. That's why I like to keep these covenants as the base covenants. And then off those covenants, there's more offshoots and promises that go to their kids. For example, when, you, when we, the, the next covenant which is the Mosaic Covenant. Is anybody confused yet in the class? Okay. Because in the Mosaic Covenant, it's actually two parts. You have the covenant of the law and the priesthood. They're two different things. And they're two different covenants. The law and the priesthood are actually two different covenants. And I'll read that to you. That is in uh, Numbers chapter 25. No, sorry. Don't go to Numbers chapter 25 just yet. Exodus 19.6 Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation... Exodus 19, verse 6. You shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And then, under the Arianic priesthood, God made a promise to Phinehas, the son of Aaron, in Numbers 25, verse 13. He gave him the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. So there's two parts of the Mosaic covenant. The covenant of the priesthood, under Aaron and the covenant of the law that was given to Moses. <clears throat> law and priesthood. And this was a covenant that God gave to him on Mount Sinai. It's also called the Sinai Covenant and all this, all different names for it. People call it different, all kinds of different names. It's but it's important to note that when someone says the Old Testament, it's really the Old Covenant. The word testament and covenant are synonymous. It means they mean the same thing. Old Covenant. But really, I like to call it the Old Covenants because there's actually many Old Covenants in the Old Testament. It's like I said... The whole Old Testament is woven with these different covenants. You can see it's not just one covenant that God made that's called the Old Covenant. There's all kinds of different ones that all kind of follow the same line with different people. Noah, Adam, the Edenic Covenant, Abraham. But you're going to see in the end here how it all comes together. Now God gave Abraham the token of his covenant was circumcision. Sir, come. 
decision. We're not going to get into all the details of it, but basically it was the cutting away of the flesh. Um, every male was circumcised on the eighth day. And it was a, it was a uh, token that preceded the law. So it didn't even come from Moses. This was the, the, the circumcision did not come from Moses. It was actually something that God had instituted uh, on nearly a thousand years earlier. So this was the token of the Abrahamic covenant. The token was the rainbow. The token was death. And now God gave them the token of, can anyone guess? The Sabbath. The Sabbath day was the token. And all these things point to Christ. All of it points to Christ. You know, the Sabbath day being the day of rest. Christ is our rest. You can go into all the studies of it. You know, but God gave them that day that they had to keep. It was a special holy day. And it symbolized the rest, the future rest that we were going to receive under the new covenant. So God gave them the Sabbath day as the token of this covenant. We're not going to go into all the different laws. There was 240 something uh, ceremonial uh, laws that they had to keep. And there was like 370 something different um, you know, moral laws that they had to keep. There was 613 total different commandments that had to be kept under this covenant. And this was a conditional covenant. Like I said last week, this was a conditional covenant because it said that there were certain things you absolutely had to keep. God gave them a law that they didn't have an option to keep. You didn't have a choice of whether or not you were going to keep the Sabbath day. You know, this, this Sabbath day was not just a token, but this was actually part of the law. Now, if it was just the token and it wasn't part of the law itself, then it wouldn't have, had, it wouldn't have been conditional. But the, the thing is, it is conditional because there were certain laws that they had to actually keep. Does that make sense? Is anyone confused? Why was this conditional, but this not unconditional? Because God made these promises not based upon condition. Mm -hmm. The land, the nation, the seed. I said, I'm going to give these things to you. Over here he says, if you shall walk before me in truth and be perfect and keep these, these, uh, these, uh, these laws, it's all based on condition. If you don't, and if you rebel against me, then you'll be cast into all four corners of the earth. And I'm going to read that to you. It says in... Psalm 103, Psalm 103, 18. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear Him and His righteousness unto children's children. This is the catch. To such as keep His covenant and those that remember His commandments to do them. If they didn't do the commandments, if they didn't follow, they would not receive God's mercy. They would not receive the fulfillment if they were not faithful. It was based upon conditions. God placed conditions upon this. They had to keep the law. If they didn't keep the law, they were cut off from their people. In Numbers chapter 15, there was a man that was gathering sticks. You guys know the story? A man was gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. They got him and they stoned him. He was killed. Why? Because this was a conditional covenant. It was conditional. And if you don't keep that covenant, then it will be broken. But this is, this is a really good verse. I'm going to read this to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 4. Uh, Romans 8, 4. I hope I wrote it down. Anybody want to read that real quick? Romans 8, 4.
Oh, 8 3. If you want to read it, Romans 8 3. But what the law could not do, mm. in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Why does it say that the law was weak? Does that make sense? It does it say that the law was weak? No, it's weak because of our flesh. That's why it was weak. It was weak because of our flesh. The law itself was not weak. It was our inability to keep it that made it weak. <laughs> it made it weak in the sense that it could not help us. It made it weak in the sense that it could not give us life. The law was weak through the flesh, was weak because of our flesh, was weak because of our flesh. Our inability to keep it. Our inability. See, we're confronted with this holy law that our flesh does not have the ability to keep. Therefore, it is weak to justify. In fact, it is impossible to justify us. Because the Bible says, Cursed is every man that does not continue in all things that are written in the law to do them. Cursed. No second chances. If a man keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point, he's guilty of all. Guilty of all. So our flesh was weak, which made the law weak to save us. It made the law weak to help us establish a relationship with God. And that's the Mosaic Covenant. In the priesthood. Now, I want to... Oh, this is good. <sighs> i got to talk about the priesthood. I was getting excited about the priesthood. You got the tabernacle, okay? It says in Exodus 19.6 that we're going to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You got the gate. You got the altar, the bronze altar, the laver. Then you have the sanctuary, okay? You got the holiest of all. You got the... Showbread over here, the light of the candlestick, the incense. Okay? You come in, you're a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You've gone to the labor, you've gone to the sacrifice, you've gone into the sanctuary, which is the holiest of all. Not the holy soul, the sanctuary, which is the holy place. Okay? And the Bible says we are entered into the holiest of the holy place. Okay? Just as the priests entered in. Okay? Exodus 19.6, and we are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We've entered into the sanctuary. But the problem is, God's here. Okay? In order to get into the holiest place, the holy of holies, you had to be more than a priest. A priest couldn't get into here. He could only get into here. But God's presence dwelt behind the veil. Okay? Even a Levite priest could never get in there. Even a Levite priest who was after the order of, of Kohath, okay, who had access to the priesthood, was within the age of the priesthood, offered all the correct sacrifices, went through all the correct washings, made it into here, could never get into here. And if he ever did, he'd die instantly. So even a priest could not get into here. Whew. That's why we have a great high priest, which is passed into the heavenlies. Okay? Now to appear in the presence of God for us. So we didn't need a priest. We needed a great high priest. A priest wasn't good enough. We needed a great high priest that could pass into the very heavens. So this was not sufficient. 
Even being a priest does not get us into here. That's why we needed something else. Something is missing in all these covenants. Something that was prophesied by all the prophets since the beginning of their prophecies was that there was going to come a day when there was going to become one seed, the seed of Abraham, there was going to come, oh, and I missed one, the Davidic covenant, there was going to become a, a son of David, a son of David, who was going to sit on his throne, according to Psalm chapter 89, of the fruit of thy body will I sit upon thy throne. God promised David a throne, a house, and a kingdom. <laughs> See all the promises are adding up? See how they're adding up? A land, a nation, a seed, a throne, a house, and a kingdom. A house for your seed to dwell. A throne for your nation. A kingdom for your land. All the pieces are coming together. He keeps adding pieces to it. He keeps adding the pieces that we need. The whole earth is going to be overspread with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. <laughs> oh man, the Mosaic law, the law was going to be fulfilled in him. It's going to be fulfilled in Christ. He was going to keep all the precepts. He was going to be the faithful Israelite, the faithful Israelite that could keep the law in all of its entirety. And when he died on the cross, he said, it is finished. It is finished. A, a lot of things were finished, but the one thing was finished was the keeping of the law. He kept the law in all the points that it needed to be kept to satisfy God. He also made an end of sin and brought in everlasting righteousness according to Daniel chapter 9 verse, 7, uh, 9, verse 27. Seventy weeks is... Uh, is given, I'm going to go into that in a bit, just one second. I'm trying to slow down. But the point is, all these things are being culminated and fulfilled in this new covenant. The new covenant. So that's the Davidic covenant. I don't want to scratch it out. But then you have the new covenant. Jeremiah chapter 31, the prophet says this. He said, Behold, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. House of Judah. Why didn't he say a covenant with the whole world? Because God was going to use Israel and Judah to be a light, to lighten the Gentiles. God was going to raise up this nation of the Jews to be a light, to lighten the, all the world. He was going to use Abraham and his seed and his offspring and the law and this holy nation and this peculiar people to bring salvation to the multitudes of the world. That was God's plan. That's why when Jesus said, don't go into any of the ways of the Gentiles, he said only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. His m primary concern in the fulfillment of this covenant was the house of Israel. It was to them, to him with the promises made. Okay? But, because they rejected their Messiah, they were cut out of that olive tree. According to Romans 11, they were cut, that branch was cut off. And now, we have been grafted in. The Gentiles are grafted in in that place. But it says, we don't bear up the roots of this tree, but the roots bear up us. The roots bear up the branches. If the lump is holy, the branch is holy. God is still dealing with them, the root of that olive tree. He still wants to bring them back, but they have rejected Him. I need more space to write. Any questions so far? See how deep this is? So the Davidic covenant is unconditional, correct? Yes, it's an unconditional promise made to David. I'm sorry I didn't write that. What was the token? The token of the Davidic covenant was... Did I write it down? Mm -hmm. 
I don't think I wrote that one down. I have to go back and study that. Sorry. Uh, I didn't write down the Davidic token. No. No, because here's the thing. Um, David is still under this dispensation. That's why. David actually is still under the, the uh, dispensation of law. And so really the tokens actually fall more in line with the dispensations. That's why. So um, I'll have to look at that, what the token was on David's covenant. If it was a token for the dispensation or if it was just a, you know, what that was. It's a good question. I'll have to look at that. Here's what happened. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. God says 70 weeks are determined upon the... I'm not going to get into the whole study of uh, tri tribulation. But he said 70 weeks are determined upon that people to, burn, to make an end to sin and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Okay? Do you have a, a teaching on it? I'm going to save it. No, I mean, you have a teaching on it. Yeah, I can do that. Um, <laughs> No, I just did a dispensation chart. I did a, a revelation banner. I'll have to show it to you. But basically what happened was it was 69 weeks of years, 483 years, okay, from the time that the temple was commissioned to be built, from the time of the building of the temple, all the way to the death of Christ. It's, that's why Jesus said, you do not know the time of your visitation. They were supposed to know when He was supposed to be there because of this prophecy. Jesus said, you're supposed to know when I'm coming. You didn't know the hour of your visitation. Here I am, 483 years after I said I was going to be here. And you didn't, you didn't know what I was saying. Would that also tie into what I shared about Revelation chapter 3? Of the hour, yeah, it ties in. That, that, that he know the hour that he comes. Yeah, it wasn't a surprise. It wasn't supposed to be a surprise. Well, like a thief in the night. No. You know, Jesus is coming again like a thief in the night. When he came, it was already prophesied the day he'd be there. Mm -hmm. It said when he was going to be there. But they didn't understand what it meant. Mm -hmm. But here's the problem. That's only 69 weeks. What happened? After the death of Christ, a miraculous thing happened. The clock stopped. The clock stopped. What does that mean? That 70 week clock of years stopped. This is 490 years. Okay? There's seven missing years. The clock stopped at the death of Christ. Where's that last week? Where's that last week? It's the seven year tribulation period when God begins to deal with the Jews again. See, that seven years is being reserved. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. God is going to restart the clock at that seven years. And He's going to begin to deal with the Jews again. When they, when they rejected their Messiah and killed their Messiah, the clock literally stopped on that 70-year time clock. That 70 week time clock, 70 weeks a year. That 490 year clock stopped at 483. And when he come, and when, when that tribulation begins, that time of Jacob's trouble, that seven year clock is going to start again. And God is going to begin to deal with the Jews about the rejection of Christ, about the cutting off of their Messiah. How does that all tie in? Because it said that 70 weeks of years are determined upon the people to make an end of sin and to bring in everlasting righteousness. When is the everlasting righteousness going to be brought in? At the end of the seven years. Eternity. Everlasting righteousness. It's not now. Because in, we're in between the 69th and 70th year. There's no everlasting righteousness right now. After the death of Christ didn't usher in everlasting righteousness, it ushered in heresy and it ushered in more sin and more rebellion and, and, and the Catholic Church and all the, the corruption and the destruction and, 
and the 20th century, which has killed more people than all the other centuries combined. It hasn't brought in everlasting righteousness. You know, the house of Jacob and the house of David were not, are not walking with God, but neither is anyone else in the world. They're not walking with God. The world is in re open rebellion against God right now. So when's the everlasting righteousness going to come in? At the end of that 70th week. So we're waiting for the end of that 70th week. When the end of that 70th week comes, that is what would usher in everlasting righteousness. But we do have a promise from God, and that's the new covenant. The new covenant between the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But what did it say? Through you shall all nations of the earth be blessed. The Bible says if we, are, if we believe, then we are counted faithful with faithful Abraham. And we are grafted into that same olive tree and are partakers of the fatness of that tree. We, have been, we are now partakers of that same covenant that started back here. Not here. It started back here. What does it say in uh, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 20? It says, The law, which is 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Because God gave it to Abraham by promise. It means this is not going to disannul this. This covenant, even though it was conditional, can't take away from my unconditional promises to Abraham. The Bible says, We are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So Jesus was the fulfillment of that. Christ, the seed who would sit upon the throne of David in the future because he didn't come to sit on a throne when he came into the world. When he came in the world as a baby, he came to make an end to sin. When he goes back, when he comes back, he's going to come to sit upon the throne of David, the promise that he made to David, the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. So the Davidic covenant is fulfilled. The Davidic covenant is fulfilled in that Christ will sit upon the throne and that there will be a kingdom according to Luke chapter 1 verse 31. Luke 1 verse 31. Oh, I'm sorry, did I say 31? I meant 32. Luke 1 verse 32. I love this passage of Scripture. Sorry, I'm going probably too long, but this is just too, too deep. He shall be great, he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto, them, unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there shall be no end. His kingdom shall have no end. And this is the stone that is cut out without hands, and that's in Daniel, that breaks down. And if you want to get into I'm not going to get into all that. But there's another st the statue, Babylon, Persia, Greece, uh, Rome, and the, the, you know, the feet that broke off into the ten kingdoms. But also it says there was a stone cut out of the mountain made without hands. And it came and break that statue into pieces. And that is the stone, the, the, the sure stone, the prophesied stone. Christ, the Bible says that rock that followed him was Christ. Christ is a stone. So the fulfillment is the throne and the kingdom, the Davidic covenant. But God also is fulfilling this seed. Just like it says, he shall reign over the house of Jacob. Why did he mention Jacob? Why did he say Jacob? Why didn't he say that the, the house of David? Well, he said he will give, be given the throne of David, but it also says he's going to reign over the house of Jacob. And if we're partakers of this, this promise that God made, this unconditional promise that God made to Abraham, which we are now grafted into, then we are, are sons and daughters of God and are partakers of this promise. This same promise. And we are going to dwell in this kingdom. Because Christ in the new covenant 
Because of Christ and the new covenant. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 10. I love Hebrews. Hebrews is oof, it's too thick, too deep. He says in Psalm 89, 29, His seed shall endure forever. His throne is the days of heaven. So that throne, it's, it's an eternal throne. I'm getting to Adam, and this is where it's really going to get good. <laughs> okay, uh, go to Hebrews chapter... Hebrews 10. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus... So, okay, so no longer are we in the sanctuary. We're not in the sanctuary. This is the sanctuary, the outer courts out here. We're not in the sanctuary. Now we can enter into the holiest place by the blood of Jesus. You know, the kingdom, you know, here in Exodus uh, 19.6, we can only get into here under that covenant. But now it's been fulfilled and that now we can enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. See, here is here's the crux of this whole message. All these were covenants between God and man. All these were covenants between God and man. God made conditional and God made unconditional covenants between God and man. But look at this. I'm almost done. I'm not going to keep you guys much longer. God made a covenant with God. God the Father says, okay, I'm going to make a covenant with my Son. God the Father and God the Son. God the Father and God the Son enter into a covenant. It is an everlasting covenant Unconditional covenant. I promise to send Christ to be the Savior of the world. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. He was that royal priest. He was that great high priest that entered into the holiest place, past the veil, the tearing of His flesh. You know, when He cried out on that cross, the Bible says the veil of the temple is written twain from the top to the bottom. He was able to enter into the holiest by the blood. Of, now we are able to enter in because Christ entered in on our behalf into the holiest place. Not to sprinkle the altar that was... Not to sprinkle the Holy of Holies, uh, the Ark of the Covenant here on earth, but the one that's in heaven. God told Moses, you're going to create everything that's in the tabernacle based upon the pattern you've seen on the top of Mount Sinai. I'm going to show you a tabernacle that's in heaven that you're going to copy and you're going to build. So there's a tabernacle in heaven. And it says there in, in Hebrews, he said the patterns of things in the heavens could be purified with the blood of bulls and goats. But he said the heavenly things themselves had to be purified with greater things than these. That's why Christ went into the presence of God in heaven to appear in the holiest holies place in heaven. Not on earth. The holiest place in heaven to appear in the presence of God for us. So God made a covenant with His Son that you're going to fulfill all these broken covenants. You're going to fulfill all the broken covenants. You're going to fulfill what man could not do because he's weak through the flesh. You're going to fulfill the Adamic covenant. You're going to fulfill the Edenic covenant. This covenant I wanted to make of life and peace and everlasting righteousness is going to be fulfilled in the new kingdom. I'm going to fulfill it. And you're going to do it. Because Christ is called... The last Adam. <laughs> it's called the last Adam. <laughs> Why? Because he did what Adam could not do. He was obedient where Adam failed. Mm -hmm. He was obedient where Adam fell. 
He fell at this tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now He's going to bring men to the tree of life. Into the everlasting kingdom, which is going to be like Eden. That's why He's called the last Adam. He's going to fulfill every mistake that everyone has ever made. And the curse is going to be lifted. The Adamic curse is going to be lifted. The curse. There shall be no more death. No more death. Nor sorrow, nor crying. Nor sorrow, nor crying. Mm -hmm. No more pain in, ch in childbearing. If there is childbearing, which there is going to be in, in some form in the new, uh, new, heaven, and the new heaven and new earth. But not of, of uh, regenerated men, but natural people. That's a whole other study in itself. But those that are uh, been redeemed and, and you know have received this, the uh, resurrected bodies are not going to have children, but there's going to be people that don't are not in resurrected bodies that are going to be reproducing. Uh, that's another study. That's just you know, it's a whole thing in itself. That goes into like revelation and stuff. But the whole point was. God cannot lie and God cannot break the covenant with Himself. I've sworn with myself in my holiness. He said by two immutable things in which God could not lie, His word and His oath. We might have strong consolation. We can trust God. This is the veracity of God because it's a covenant between God and God. It's not a covenant between man and man, God and man. All these other covenants were weak because of man's inabilities. Now this, these covenants, these unconditional covenants weren't necessarily weak in the sense that God wasn't keeping His end of the bargain. But there were times where people in, like Jacob sinned and um, you know when his sons sinned, when they went out and killed all the, the people, uh, the... Um, it slew the people that raped their daughter, their, their sister. There's all kinds of different instances where people sinned and fell and transgressed and couldn't keep the, the precepts and the righteousness. But God ushered it all in through the everlasting, unconditional new covenant. The covenant between God and His Son. And that covenant, that is the one that I'm trusting in. That's the one I trust. The covenant between God and God. Amen. The covenant that brings us into the holiest place. Where we could only get here, but now we can get here. There's another scripture I wanted to read. I'm basically... Oh, in Isaiah chapter 24, verse 5, The earth is defiled under the inhabitants thereof because they have transgressed the law, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. So because Israel and their transgression and rebellion against God, they broke their covenant and were exiled to Babylon. But God in His mercy brought them back to try to restore them and get the temple rebuilt. So in all these different instances, you can see man's failure and all culminated in this one everlasting covenant that God restores them. Any questions? Class, is there any questions? I didn't hear a whole lot of questions. I, have, I needed a couple of clarifications yeah. on the Adamic covenant because the token was death, I understood that, but it was unconditional. But it seems like um, when we describe the Adamic covenant, which is, was, you know, the after effects of the fall was mm -hmm. sweat and pain and turmoil yeah. in the childbearing, it looks <laughs> like it was just the effects of the fall, in a sense. All those things, they were just effects, they were after effects. Um, but what I'm trying to say is, I didn't really, I cannot grasp the... Um, how Jesus what was fulfilled the covenant in all of this. It was know? a promise. It was no, an oath. Just, 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 no. I thought it was conditional because he said don't eat of the tree. That was the Adenic. Oh, she's That's, talking about the Yeah, Adenic. the Adamic, yeah. because I'm saying 
Oh, what is the covenant? But God, them? yes, God promised them the sweat and the pain yeah. and the uh, sorrow. But it seems like it was it would happen anyway because they were just after effects, natural after effects of of the fall. It seems uh, like they would happen anyway. It was really a, it was but a. Then he gave a, he gave seed. That, the that promise of the coming of, seed. Uh, uh, yeah, I didn't yeah, get into that. Step on the, on the head. Yeah. yeah. That was the, that was the, the what he that said, was was another... Was thank you for mentioning that because you can't cover everything when you do these teachings. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 says that God would put enmity between the serpent and the woman, between her seed and his seed. Mm -hmm. So that was the promise there. I didn't even mention it. That's why it was so confusing. That's why I... <laughs> It's got to go through these notes and add that in. Because that's what we're doing, see. That, I missed that, see. I didn't put that in because I was going too fast. But Genesis 3.15 gives us the understanding of that. And then Christ also fulfilling that. You know, Christ fulfilling that. And that He absolutely did that at the cross. Yeah, that's a, that's a major part. That's a major part of it. I'm glad you saw that. Um, but you know another thing about that? Even without Genesis chapter 3.15, without that seed, Christ also fulfilled even those. You know why? Christ was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He also was a carpenter, but you know what else? He surely died. He surely died. So, <laughs> it, it, it just all fits in. It all fits in. He said, the day you eat, you shall surely die. Christ said, okay, I'll surely die. So basically, the Adamic covenant is fulfilled, correct? Completely fulfilled. Oh, yeah, the seed. Remember the seed? That yeah, yes, that, Christ, that one. Christ is the last Adam, so yeah. that's it. He fulfilled everything that Adam has. The Adenic covenant has not been fulfilled, but the Adamic has, because that was, that was completed at the cross. That promise was that Christ would be do you guys understand why that is? The Edenic covenant is about the future restoration, God's future plan. So God's plan was to make the Garden of Eden a place of perfect peace and everlasting you know, righteousness. Mm -hmm. uh, that has not been fulfilled until the kingdom age. God is going to have an Eden in the future, basically another Eden. A yes, little so bit there's, more. There's one more to be fulfilled. Only one? No. No. How many? The Abrahamic covenant is still going to be fulfilled too when Israel gets that land. Oh, yeah. But what I'm saying is Christ in ultimately who sees the end from the beginning and is the culmination of all these covenants in one will fulfill all of them if He has not already is the point. Some of them are yet future. There's even a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament still future. But the point is is that Christ is going to fulfill all of them in their entirety. But yes, the Adamic covenant was fulfilled when Christ died. See, I love that. The day you eat, you shall surely die. He said, okay, Adam, I'm going to step in and I'm going to die. That's why he's the last Adam. Yeah, and then he crushed the serpent on the death. Mm -hmm. he... Christ crushed the serpent. Mm -hmm. What else? What are, any other questions I can add to the notes? You understand why the law was a conditional covenant? Yeah, you have to do all the sacrifices. Yeah, yeah. the sacrifices and the precepts. Even keeping the Sabbath. It's keeping the Sabbath. A condition. Of it's a condition. Keeping the Sabbath. Right. Which basically that was that was introduced to the Adamic through God killing yeah. the first the, the death. Yeah, we talked the about animal. that last we week that with last the skins. Mm -hmm. When you understand the covenants, you start be like understanding how deep it gets. It just keeps getting deep. Like you could even get deeper. I didn't talk about Phinehas and the priesthood and how he slew Cosby and Selu. And God made a covenant with him. And God used Aaron, the high priest, and made a covenant with his sons. And God made a covenant with Levi. The Levi would bear the priesthood because it was supposed to be the firstborn. 
It was supposed to be the first, every firstborn male was supposed to be consecrated wholly to the Lord. They were supposed to be the priesthood. They were supposed to do the ordinances. But God chose one tribe, Levi, to, be, to bear the priesthood, to bear the responsibilities instead of the firstborn. And so it just goes deep. Like I said, it goes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all those, you know, covenants were made. But these are the root covenants. The root covenants where everything comes from. Thank you. Kasumu Bible Institute is out of session. Your homework is <laughs> to study. <laughs> yeah. And Paul Ryan, see where he is. Is he okay? Something happened? Is he alive? I don't know.